started. Um, welcome. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, and thank you for joining us for our last talk of the academic year. Um, my name is Erica Kwam. I'm the interim director here at Purdue Galleries. Today we'll be speaking with Ali Brandt, guest curator for the current Ringel exhibition titled She Contains Multitudes. Brandt is an independent curator and art historian um, with degrees from Purdue University and Sotheby's Institute of Art. So just a few quick things before we get started. Um, like I said, we are recording, so I'll be keeping you on mute for the duration of the talk, um, but we will be doing a Q&A at the end. So please enter any questions that you have into the chat and then I'll read them out later, or you'll have a chance to ask Ali yourself at the end of the talk. Um, we'll have this session available on our exhibition page later in case you miss part of it or you have to, you know, pop off the call for another call. Goodness knows in this virtual time, we just have Zoom call after Zoom call. So anyway, uh, you can find us at purdue.edu slash galleries. Um, so that's where the talk will be posted later on. Um, I should also mention that Ringel Gallery is currently closed for maintenance and will reopen on Monday. Uh, so I will be posting a link of the um, collections database into our chat which I will do now um, so that you have a chance mm -hmm. to, I said I would do that. Sorry, I'll do that in just a second. Um, so I'll post a collections uh, database link in chat so you can view all the artwork and it's um, all the info for it as well uh, virtually. Um, so once we reopen on Monday, this exhibition will be on display uh, in Ringel Gallery, like I said, in Stewart Center until May 14th of 2021 obviously. Uh, the hours for Ringel Gallery are Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Saturdays noon to 4. So before I hand it over, I'd like to say a few quick but giant thank yous, uh, primarily to Ali, our guest curator, um, for this amazing exhibition. Uh, Carrie Kelb, our curatorial intern. Lana Newhart-Kellen, uh, Purdue Gallery's Collections and Facilities Manager, who made this entire exhibition possible by um, finding all the works in our collection. So all the works on display um, are part of Purdue Gallery's permanent collection. Um, and a huge thank you to all of our interns and gallery attendants who literally keep the doors open. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our guest curator for She Contains Multitudes, Ali Brandt. Thank you, Ali, for speaking with us today. Thanks, Erica. Um, before I start sharing um, the exhibition with you, I would also like to take a few minutes to thank the many people who worked very hard on this exhibition, um, not only making it a reality, but making it a very rich and engaging dialogue between the art, the artist, the university, and the viewers. Um, um, first, I'd like to thank um, Purdue Gallery's Interim Director, Erica Kwam, for bringing me on to guest curate um, the exhibition, starting way back in 2020, which now seems kind of like a lifetime ago. Um, without her eagerness to get me on board and her passion for the enrichment of the Purdue Galleries, this exhibition would not have been possible. Um, it's been such a great experience working with her both professionally and personally. Um, I would also um, like to thank uh, the Purdue Gallery's collection manager, Lana Newhart-Kellen, um, who, as Erica mentioned, worked so hard to locate and install all of the artworks in a very, in the middle of a very stressful, though much needed collections move. Um, so I'm really appreciative of everything that she has done. Um, I would also like to thank um, the gallery's intern, um, Carrie Kelb, who not only rooted out more artworks to include in the exhibition, but also greatly impressed me with her research and label writing abilities. Um, I have no doubt that she will make a really great curator one day. Um, I would also like to say a, a huge thank you to Associate Professor in printmaker, ma uh, Printmaking, uh, Jennifer Scheuer, um, who generously reached out to a number of the printmakers included in this exhibition to get responses and reflections on their artworks, um, further opening and deepening the dialogue with the artworks and the viewers. I'd also like to extend a sincere thank you to a number of Purdue professors and staff who graciously offered their time and experience um, expertise uh, to contribute uh, to this exhibition, both writing labels and providing insights into the artworks and material processes. 
Thank you to um, Sigrid Zeiner, um, Jennifer Kaufman Bueller, uh, Linda Martin, Kathy Evans, as well as uh, Chris Christine Wenschel and Shannon McMullen. Finally, I would like to thank the many talented artists who answered Jen's call for responses and reflections. Thank you to Margot Myers, Mina Resnick, Melanie Yadzi, Ina Kaur, and Delita Martin. Your personal and artistic insertion all the more vibrant and impactful. So thank you very much to everybody who helped make this um, exhibition a possibility. Um, now that I have thanked everyone, it would probably be a little prudent for me to um, introduce you to who I am and a little bit about my work, um, though Erica did sort of briefly co cover the bases. Um, I'm a Purdue graduate, uh, earning my Bachelor of Arts in Art History from Purdue um, in their own art and design department in 2012. Um, after graduating, I earned some art world experience here in Indiana, um, first taking an internship at the reg registration department of the Indianapolis Museum of Art, um, and then working for a time at an Indianapolis auction house. I then went to live for a year in London where I earned my master's at the Sotheby's Institute of Art um, with a degree in fine and decorative arts. I used my object-based study and knowledge gained at Sotheby's to write my dissertation on the very niche subject of symbolic representations of armor in Elizabethan portraiture. And you can see an image um, from my dissertation by Nicholas Hilliard in the upper right hand corner. Um, I, from London, I went uh, to Los Angeles, um, where I lived and worked for um, around three years. And I had the great uh, pleasure of guest curating two exhibitions at the Huntington Library Art, um, Huntington Library Art Museums and Botanical Gardens. Um, the first of these exhibitions uh, featured the asylum arts of Charles Doyle, the father of famed Sherlock Holmes author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, um, an example of which can be seen at the bottom right on the slide. Um, and the second exhibition um, was of artworks by the great British Victorian art critic, John Ruskin, as well as the work of his many frenemies um, to celebrate his 100th birthday. Um, since returning to Indiana at the end of 2019, I have been a limited term lecturer in art history here at Purdue, teaching art history um, since 1400 and Baroque and Rococo art. Um, I've also guest curated this exhibition, which I will now um, show to you all. The exhibition uh, was first uh, conceived by interim director Erica Klom uh, with the desire and aim to showcase the work of the many talented women artists of Purdue's permanent collection. Um, the exhibition brings together not only many different artistic styles and approaches, but also artists of different artistic and cultural backgrounds. With the help of galleries intern Carrie Kelb, I further expanded um, the exhibition list to include a number of other artworks. If you can't tell from the office wall behind me, I'm a bit of a maximalist when it comes to artwork, the more the merrier in, in my opinion. Um, the artworks are loosely grouped together based on visual themes starting to the left of the door. Um, we have works that are abstracted nature images followed by interpretations and renderings of the landscape. Um, so abstracted nature and starting with the landscape here. Um, next we have works that are explorations in formal abstraction, followed by artists who examine the various roles of women within society. Then we have artists who explore the themes of cultural identity um, as well as personal identity through the depictions of the human figure. Finally, we have a group of works which feature visual narratives. The works included in this exhibition are as varied as the artist who made them. They stand as a testament to their unique experiences, artistic viewpoints, and cultural worldviews. 
Though all of the artists represented in the exhibition are female, there is really no single artistic medium, style, or approach that can completely define them. Hence the title, She Contains Multitudes, which is a play on a line from Walt Whitman's poem, Song of Myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Now, since many of you might not have had the chance to go see the exhibition, whether through time constraints or because of your geographic location or because the um, galleries are currently closed for renovation, I thought it would be beneficial to briefly introduce you to each work and artist. So we will start our journey. Uh, directly to the left, upon entering the gallery, we have the work of Nada Shalabi, and her work, Where Rivers Meet, features abstracted natural forms. She is an Egyptian-American artist who was born in Cairo, but has lived and worked in many cities, including Chicago and New York. This work the, looks at the topogra uh, topography of language and shows uh, the convergence of East and West, through the overlay of two rivers, the Nile representing Cairo, Egypt, and the Mississippi representing Cairo in Southern Illinois. These locations, though far removed, are both connected through name and as well as proximity to major rivers. Next, we have an etching by Joan Mitchell, one of the notable women artists from the abstract expressionist movement. She worked among many such distinguished female abstract expressionists such as Elaine de Kooning, Lee Kranzner, and Helen Frankenthaler, as well as the more widely known male colleagues, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and Mark Rothko. This work is the product of Mitchell's desire to, quote, make something like the feeling of a dying sunflower. The work perfectly captures her expressive gestures and painterly use of color. Continuing with the abstracted nature theme, we have the work of contemporary printmaker Margot B. Myers, um, who distills her own observations and responses to the sublime power of nature into large scale works of intricate lines and repetitive patterns. This work is derived from a larger collection of prints which Meyer produced for her MFA thesis. She provided a statement explaining the work saying, quote, this piece represents a shell undergoing a metamorphosis, adopting a form that is more sinister and less identifiable. The ubiquitous shell, of course, represents life, discovery, knowledge, growth, death, and decay. The piece is used, the piece uses, uses scale, obsessively worked etching plates, and installation to exaggerate and experience sorry, to exaggerate the experience of finding and holding one of these intimately sized exoskeletons. This ethereal lithograph is by the Navajo artist Emmy Whitehorse. Though she is a native artist, she works outside the bounds of traditional native art forms such as pottery or basketry and does not use traditional Navajo imagery or patterns. Instead, her work seeks to break out of the visual expectations and cultural stereotypes often placed on Native artists. Her work is an expression of how she perceives and experiences the natural world around her. This untitled print is from Emmy Whitehorse's Minimalist Period and creates the feeling of a floating landscape suspended in both time and space. The work functions as a transition um, in the exhibition between the abstracted nature works and works that deal with depictions of the landscape itself. Katarzyna Vincek is a Polish printmaker. Many of her works feature aerial and um, aerial views of the landscape dotted with structures and crisscrossed by roads. To Vincek, the landscape serves as a metaphor for human life mapping important memories, events, and pivotal turning points. In her artistic practice, as well as in her teaching, Vincek advocates for the use of ecological graphic techniques um, and, and materials, demonstrating that the preservation of the land is just as important to her as depicting it. Florence Lonsford was a self-taught Indiana artist who is best known at Purdue, at least, as a generous benefactress of the arts. 
Through the Lonsford Fund, the Purdue Galleries is able to acquire new works for the collection with particular emphasis on artworks to populate the grounds, so sculptural works. Um, her work, Sunset with Boats, demonstrates her keen sense of color and line and shows a deep understanding of how colors present in both light and shadow. I particularly love the inclusion of the sun-drenched boat in the background, um, really juxtaposes with the more the darker, more muted tones of the, the boats in shadow in the foreground. German artist um, Heike Negenborn is best known for her highly realistic paintings of German um, and French countrysides. Um, in her work, Linescape, which is part of a larger series of lithographs, Negenborn peels back her typical photorealistic paint layer to reveal the landscape's underlying structure. This gives the viewer a peek into her very meticulous um, art process, which uses precise mathematical and ge um, geometrical calculations. The last artist working in the landscape vein is Eleanor Brockenbrow, who approaches landscape in a much more traditional way, working in the tradition. Um, sorry, working in the style of American Impressionism. Brockenbrow uses light and color to to render a copse of trees with their leaves just beginning to change. Brockenbrow was a local Lafayette um, artist um, who studied painting at the Art Institute of Chicago, as well as um, was the first uh, woman president of the La Lafayette Art Association. Um, so she has a very um, distinguished uh, career locally. The first of two artists working in the vein of visual um, abstraction is Betty Gold. Um, Gold favors geometric forms and bright, vibrant colors, which offer her endless possibilities for experimentation and reconfiguration. Gold also produces large bronze and enameled steel sculptures, one of which can be seen at Purdue's Pickett Memorial Park. Indian American artist Zarina Hashmi is known simply by the mononym Zarina. Um, her work, though abstract in nature, echoes the forms of houses, floor, floor plans, and boundaries. They express her feelings of displacement and alienation, which has stayed with her ever since she and her family experienced the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan. Through her work, Zarina conveys her longing for a home which is no longer there, and often contains words or phrases in her native language of Urdu. Mary Cassatt is probably the most well-known female impressionist artist, though she is still somewhat overshadowed by her male colleagues, Degas, Monet, and Renoir. Cassatt's work often feature intimate domestic scenes showing quiet and private moments in women's lives. As a woman in the 19th century, Cassatt was not able to go to all of the places that male artists could, nor was she allowed access to important artistic um, teaching, such as figure drawing, from live models. Instead, Cassatt and the other female artists um, of the age had to do, um, sorry, had to make do with the models that were available to them in their own immediate circles, which more often than not consisted of women and children. This work um, has the distinction of being the only three-dimensional work um, in the exhibition. Um, and the work is very, very small. Um, it takes the form of an, a Victorian stand mirror resting on a marble and mahogany plinth um, with an arrangement of really delicate pink flowers. In the mirror, we see a room um, in which um, reflected on the surface, presumably the room in which this mirror sits. Um, in uh, the mirror, we see two figures um, of women, a mother and a daughter with the image of yet another woman um, which I'm sort of circling with my um, pointer here, um, hanging on the wall behind them. What Kath Mitchell shows us are three generations of women and calls the viewer to consider each woman's place within this maternal line through the title, All Mothers Are Daughters. 
Uh, Wanda Ewing was a Nebraska born printmaker, um, multimedia and fiber artist, best known um, for her very provocative compositions, which examine black female representations, identity, sexuality, beauty standards, empowerment and objectification. Her work is often comical, though with a very biting undertone of social commentary. Ewing often, sorry, Ewing often takes um, famous works of art from history and subverts their meanings. Cornucopia bears a striking resemblance to Courbet's um, equally provocative, The Origin of the World. Um, this work can be interpreted as a sort of tongue in cheek commentary on the role of women as life givers. Um, bisecting the female form and leaving the portion that seems to be women's only value in society. Um, it also invokes the idea of Mother Earth or Mother Nature through the abundance of flowers in, in the composition. Um, for this work I, um, by Mina Resnick, I wanted to read a short excerpt from the artist's response um, within the exhibition itself. In my first, sorry, in my almost five decade career as an artist, my work has broadly focused on the visual meaning of language. Communication is elusive and dependent on historical and cultural contexts. Words and images that appear common to one generation may be unknown to another. This allows my work to examine the changing nature of experience over the course of time and aging, and to comment on the themes of expectation and reality, the ideal and the everyday including the personal internal debate which occurs when women confront themselves and their role within contemporary society. Kath Kollwitz uh, was associated with the German Expressionist movement and is often depicted, um, she has often depicted the darker sides of human existence in her work, such as suffering, death, and bereavement. Kolwitz shared her studio with her husband, Carl, who was a doctor to Berlin's poorest populations. She saw firsthand the true depths of humanity and used her work to immortalize their suffering as well as her own. Kolwitz tragically lost her son in World War I, um, and we can see in this work a mother clinging to the lifeless form of her son, while the bony arm of death um, tries to pull him from her grasp. We'll now move on to the visual theme of cultural and personal identity. Um, Indian American artist Sarjani Ja Johnson uses the medium of color intaglio prints to explore her memories and impressions of India. She seamlessly weaves together images of plants, animals, and Hindu deities to create intricate jewel-like compositions. In this work, Ja Johnson includes the figure of the Hindu goddess Parvati, who is associated with um, fertility. The titular bitter melon behind the goddess. In a quote about her work, Ja Johnson states, I believe that the dialogue about culture and nationality is vital, and that the visual arts are an important forum for communication of the subtleties and variations of individual viewpoints. Printmaker Delita Martin, Purdue MFA graduate. Um, her work offers new perspectives of marginalized women reconstructing Black female identities through visual language of signs and symbols. Um, in her statement on this work, Martin explains, in my work, the bowl is used to demonstrate the transition, birthing the female figure into a spiritual realm. The female figure's eyes are highlighted as a reminder that human beings have dual existence viewed as one body. Her head wrap establishes a space in her identity, and in transition, she sheds that head wrap in becoming. My process of layering with symbols and objects creates a holding space where identities converge, creating a filter for interpretation and altering narratives for women of color. Carmen Bordas is a Mexican painter and printmaker from Guadalajara, Jalisco. Um, her work draws inspiration from the great Mexican muralist and surrealist artists, artists um, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. To Bordas, uh, surrealism is more real than 
reality, um, a quality which she seeks to capture in her work. In this work, we have a family in early 1900s attire that are seemingly cast adrift in a boat accompanied by a large tree with severed branches. The title La Barca um, not only references the boat in which the family sits, but also a small town in the Mexican state of Jalisco, a place which Bordas would have been intimately familiar. Um, Ina Kerr uses um, abstract imagery to convey the complexity of cultural and personal identity. This work was originally created um, for an of the Middle East, um, in her state of delicacy of political and social situations, in differences and the unknowns between the cultures, they are to be celebrated. Um, in today's work, sorry, in today's world, these differences are directed towards misconceptions and deceived perceptions. We as humans need to unveil these differences and celebrate the global community rather than target them for our own personal gains. Ethiopian photographer Ada Moline sits at a crossroads between traditional and modern sensibilities. Her photographs take inspiration from traditional forms of body painting, which are found across Africa, and alludes to the many masks that we wear, either for power, wealth, or acceptance. Moline uh, works in a series, often running her photo shoots like they were a film production. Um, she is an advocate for the education of local African photographers and artists. She founded the Desta for Amer African Creative Consulting, which seeks to create a local talent pool of Ethiopian photographers who can then go forth and document their own communities um, and reality, providing a balanced perspective of Africa for the rest of the world to see. New York-based artist Jenny Morgan brings a unique approach to the traditional art of figure painting. She builds up photorealistic portraits, which she then strips back by blurring and sanding down her figures. Um, the work on the left is an example of both techniques. Um, the top layer of the figure in the foreground is sanded down to reveal the bright lit red layer of paint beneath. Behind is the figure of Morgan herself, which has been blurred to create a ghost-like specter. The resulting image juxtaposes the cor corporeal and the intangible. The work on the right um, is a screen print, a medium which Morgan occasionally uses. Um, it explores her deep fascination with concepts of auras and aura photography, um, a form of div divination uh, akin to tarot or palm reading. Um, she has rendered the aura of a favorite model, Siri, um, in deep blues and vibrant magentas, oranges, and yellows. Uh, Melanie Yazzi is a printmaker, sculptor, and painter um, living and working in Colorado. Her work explores the role of women in Dine culture, memories from her childhood growing up on the Navajo reservation, and seeks to educate the world at large um, about contemporary indigenous peoples and their post-colonial issues. Um, in her statement about the work, Yazi says, this print is about my relationship with my grandmother, Thelma Baldwin. She was my mother's mother. And when I was little, I stayed with my mother's parents a lot. Her husband's name was Tom Baldwin and they are like parents to me as I grew up. I wanted to show just how beautiful she is. She and my grandfather have passed away in the past 10 years. The sadness and the pain um, from it st is still present. Um, it's very difficult for me and I miss them very much. Sama al Shabi is a mixed media artist who uses photographs, video, and immersive installations to examine feelings of displacement. Born in Basra to an Iraqi father and a Palestinian mother, Al Shabi experienced a childhood marred by war, hunger, and exile. This work is based on narratives of her family's forced migration from Palestine to Iraq um, and eventually to America. 
the central figure of the work is Alshabi herself, visibly pregnant and wearing an ornate headdress. On her belly is written, enough for me to remain in my country's embrace, to be in her as a handful of dust, a sprig of grass. We um, have now arrived at the final grouping of artworks, uh, which deal with the visual, um, with that, sorry, that deal with visual narratives. Kara Walker's uh, black and white silhouettes deal with the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and historical memory, and often feature disturbing images of exploitation and violence against black bodies in antebellum America. In her work, Walker uses the art of the silhouette, an art form traditionally used by white upper-class Americans in the 18th and 19th century to illustrate her narratives of comedic horror. In this work, a young girl bends over the form of a severed head um, and holds out her hand either in conversation or as if to scold her macabre companion. Judy Youngblood also utilizes the art of the silhouette in her prints, which are laden with a rich, sorry, a rich visual symbolism. Her work takes its inspiration from the extreme weather patterns of her native Texas, and they explore the paradoxical human desire for both stability and change. The shifting weather patterns and surging waves reflect the ever-changing emotional state of a person's inner world. Youngblood personally makes her work open to interpretation, providing the viewer, the viewer with universal yet ambiguous symbols. Latvian printmaker Maya Dragun um, has developed a unique visual language through over 40 years of practice. Her enigmatic lithographs feature strange and surreal visions of carnivals, masks, musicians, shells, birds, and fish and take their inspiration from strange forms found in nature and folklore. Dragoon possess, possesses a keen command of the lithographic process, and she does not make pre preparatory sketches. Rather, she develops a composition in her head and follows it from start to finish on the lithography stone. Um, the rhythmic interplay between her black and white lines entrances and dazzles with its dramatic contrasts. The last artist included in the visual narratives grouping is the Swiss-born artist Angelica Kaufmann, who worked in the neoclassical style throughout the latter half of the 18th century. She was a very successful portrait painter, but wanted to be known instead for his, her historical and mythological compositions, which at this time were seen as the highest forms of art. Kaufmann, like Mary Cassatt, was hampered in her artistic education by being barred from taking life drawing classes. Despite this, she forged a distinguished career, becoming one of only two female founding members of the Royal Academy of Art in London. So to conclude, um, from the allegorical and narrative works of Angelica Kaufman and Kara Walker to the vibrant photographic portraits of Jenny Morgan and Ida Molinet, she contains multitudes presents a multiplicity of artistic styles and media created by the many talented women artists of the Purdue Permanent Collection. I hope that this exhibition um, shows viewers that there really is no single artistic medium, style, or approach that can completely encompass a female artist. She cannot be so easily defined because she, in fact, contains multitudes. Um, again, a big thank you to everyone who worked very hard to make this exhibition. I'm so very appreciative of all you have done. Um, thank you everyone for attending. And I believe we now have time for some questions. Thank you so much. Um, it, I always just love listening to you talk about all the different artists and the things that like, I, I'm not sure that a lot of people understand how much research goes into exhibitions and it really, like it really shows. Um, speaking of research, uh, Sarah wanted to ask, um, were the pieces with a local or regional affiliation, either well by well-known artists or not, um, important for you to incorporate in the exhibition? And do you have a favorite work and um, excellent selection of interesting and diverse pieces? So, uh, Thank you for the question. Um, it was really important to include the local artists, particularly those with ties to Purdue. 
Um, that being said, they are more difficult to research. Um, so in wanting to, you know, cover them and also do justice to them, it, it is a little bit more difficult to find that, that very rich um, breadth of information, um, especially if the artists um, have already passed on uh, and there is, is not much um, record of them. Um, my favorite work, um, though all of the artworks are, you know, really amazing, I would have to say Maya Dragoon. She, her works are just so fascinating and I'm a huge fan of both line um, and masks and carnivals and sort of the stranger um, types of images found in art. Um, and she has a number of other works in the Purdue um, collection that are, are also very fascinating. Okay, we've got a few more questions in chat. So um, Patrick would like to ask, um, can you say more about the decisions you made in the course of placing each of these very different works physically in the exhibition? And how does this relate to the order in which you've chosen to present them today? Um, and then follow up question. Um, can you say more about how women have carved out spaces for themselves in predominantly male artistic movements, which I think you can speak to directly? Um, and how have strategies for doing this changed over time? Or how can you determine that? Can we break this down? So I know that's quite a long one. And then I'll answer. Uh, so firstly, how did you decide how to set up the exhibition? Because I know that's a question that a lot of students ask as well. Yeah, and uh, you would be surprised um, as a planner, I didn't, I like mostly planned about how I wanted to group the works together. Um, but when you're in the space, it's a completely different animal, um, having to work out, um, you know, where exactly to place things. Some works might not look good next to other works. You want to create um, sort of visual um, cohesion. Um, but this is very difficult in a in an exhibition that has you know works by so many different artists. Um, it was really literally just placing paintings and objects against walls and then puzzle piecing them out. And it was really more about gut feeling and and visuals than it was about um, sort of thematics. Um, I did have to rearrange my themes so they weren't as um, connected as I had originally had them. Um, but that's just sort of the nature of um, having all these moving pieces and putting them into this big puzzle piece. Yeah. And then um, how does it relate to the order in which you've chosen to present them? Um, so the order is was literally, you know, how they fit into the space. Um, but I, I really wanted to make sure that I had the artworks that um, looked at um, the abstractions of nature and landscape. I wanted those to be together because they are, are connected and, and interplay with one another, um, as well as the works that um, sort of look into both the societal roles of women, um, as well as cultural and personal identities. Um, so really most of these works could be interchanged into many different um, thematic groupings. Um, and this is just sort of what I arrived at um, through looking at these works for, for many, many months. Um, and really the odd group out was the visual narratives. They were all sort of artists that dealt with sort of narrative themes, but couldn't be placed really in all the other um, themes. So um, it was a really interesting uh, way to organize the, the exhibition with having some groups that had to be next to each other, but then other groups that you could sort of interchange um, depending on how the space worked. Um, and I have a feeling this could probably be a dissertation of it, in and of <laughs> itself, but um, during your research, um, did you find out more about how women have carved out spaces for themselves in predominantly male artistic movements? Uh, through lot, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, that sounds familiar. You know, uh, it's, it's a real struggle. Um, many women artists, uh, not just in this exhibition, but historically, um, have wanted to be considered for their art and not just because of their, their gender. Um, and that is uh, something that I, you know, that I considered with this exhibition of, you know, we are sort of segregating these women artists all together and grouping them by their gender. But um, would these artists have been seen um, without us grouping them and elevating up them up to um, having this exhibition? Um, so there is the struggle to, you know, be considered 
taken seriously as an artist and also not being considered as an artist based solely on because you're a women artist. Um, so it's it's very complicated. It's a long struggle, um, and we're still still trying to fight this fight. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Kit asked if this video will be available. Yes, it will be um, under our exhibitions tab on purdue.edu slash galleries. We'll probably share the link on social media as well. So um, that will be up as soon as we get it up and get it up on YouTube. And yeah, probably within the next week. Um, but feel free to email galleries at purdue.edu if you have any questions. Um, Jen says, uh, thanks for all your hard hard work and time uh, curating the exhibition, which she is entirely correct. Thank you for. Um, in doing your research, did anything surprise you? Asks Byron. Ooh. Um, I mean, really, probably how much um, all of these works are connected, even though they're so very different. I would see you know, connections and echoes within each of the works, um, you know, as I've looked at them and as I've, uh, I've experienced them. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a lot of, you know, personal anecdotes of each of the artists that were surprising. Um, one in particular of um, Maya Dragoon, she is the daughter of a, um, of an anti-communist cartoonist who was um, deported to Siberia where he died. Um, and she really didn't get to know him um, other than through the books that he left behind. Um, and so through his art books, as well as through an aunt who was a sculptor, um, she was able to really develop this deep, um, very graphic um, artistic career um, that works very similarly to, you know, what her father produced, but also adds her own, um, you know, individualistic style to it. That's fascinating. Yeah, and I wanted to put it in the label, but it just didn't didn't fit. Didn't fit all those things in the labels and not have everybody reading That's it. That's the one sad thing is like you can't fit every bit of information that you find into the labels. The labels are maybe about twenty five percent of all of the information that I have found on, you know, each of the artists. Yeah. Um. Chris June asks, um, has researching the works for this exhibition, including the local artist, inspired you for any future exhibitions you might want to create? Um, yes, but also, you know, I'm not really sure what, you know, what I want to do next. There's so many possibilities and the collection at Purdue itself um, really poses this, this interesting puzzle because it is so, varied. Um, you could really take this in a million different um, directions. And um, I was really surprised at how much I really enjoyed looking at all the prints. I'm not pre predominantly a print um, specialist or prints have never really been a deep interest of mine, but the plethora of print artists um, in this have really um, sort of opened my, my interest into printmakers. Um, and there's a number of printmakers from the 1960s who have works in the collection that look really fascinating um, and might be a, a good, good um, thing to look at. But they're majority, um, they're mostly male artists. So it then would be completely doing a 180 and going the, the all male exhibition route. So who knows? Yeah, I'd love to see a tally on how many exhibitions are actually all male anyway. Yeah. Um, any other quick questions? Uh, well, it doesn't have to be quick even. Um, we've got a few minutes. So um, you can enter them in the chat. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. That's totally fine. Um, we've got some time. Allie, I'm going to have to leave the meeting, but thank you very much. You're welcome. For this presentation and for making us, me in particular, familiar with several artists whose names I didn't know before. And it's really nice to make the, this type of discovery. Thank really you. Really glad you could join us. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I did have one question. Um, did I understand that the Ringel Gallery is um, not open right now? And, and will it be open before this gallery is over? Yes. Uh, Ringel Gallery and Stewart Center is currently closed for maintenance. 
we had an unexpected um, floor bath, bath last week and uh, REM has had to close and dry the walls out completely. <laughs> Um, so we will be uh, re, uh, reinstalling the exhibition on Friday and patching and painting and getting it all ready to reopen on Monday. So it will be back open on Monday, um, which I believe is the 19th. Um, and then it will stay open, knock on wood, um, until uh, the exhibition closes on May 14th. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, it was a real shame to come on and say, well, the exhibition's not technically open, but uh, it will be again, I promise, very soon. And I actually haven't seen it, like, completely <laughs> yet, so. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, any quick questions? Preferably not about hoovering water off of the gallery. <laughs> um, Casper asks, um, as time progresses, how do you think that inclusivity and the uplifting of the voices of marginalized people will alter future exhibitions at Purdue and in a broader sense? Um, I think it will further enrich our understanding of art. Um, we desperately need to further open up the art historical canon um, to, you know, both artists but also art forms that have not, you know, previously be con been considered um, to be important or noteworthy. Um, and, you know, the the current climate really um, is greatly informed how I approached. Um, a lot of the artworks, as well as the the further opening up of um, the, the the types of representation that we have, um, and the artists um, and their backgrounds who we are representing. Um, so that this is something that we are going to continue to strive for both here at Purdue, but also in sort of the broader um, art historical sense, um, both in, you know, classes and curriculum. And as far as Purdue galleries goes, our mission is to make art accessible, diverse, and inclusive. So this is something that we will be consistently striving for um, for the foreseeable future, because those things are very important to us and to um, Purdue University at large. Any other questions? Uh, we'll do a little last call. Um, and again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them in chat. I know I love hearing myself talk, so I don't mind reading them out. I think that actually might be it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, yep. Yeah. And uh, Nancy from Oregon um, says uh, thank you and thank you for the opportunity to be introduced to a few new artists. So I'm glad you're able to join us, Nancy. Um, excellent. And some thanks for rolling in. Um, so thank you, Ali, so much for talking us through the exhibition and your background and your research. It's been a phenomenal experience to to see you work on this exhibition and it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to be. So um, I say that it will be a wonderful place to be yeah. on Monday. Opens, um, yeah. yeah. Um, but like I said, um, Ringle Gallery will reopen Monday, uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Monday through Friday, Saturdays from noon to four. Um, the exhibition will be up until May 14th and we look forward to seeing you all in the space. Um, this talk will be posted on purdue.edu slash galleries when we're done. So thanks for being here this evening and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.